a broad spectrum of electronic rights, both fungible, non-fungible, exclusive, shared, and others. And I'll turn it over to you, Kate. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for the intro. Um, so I'm actually going to be talking about something today that builds on top of ERTP. At the time that I think we were signing up for this uh, slot, we weren't able to publicly talk about this, so I'm really excited to share it with you guys now. Um, but what I'm talking about is um, adding a layer of safety to smart contracts that we haven't seen before, um, and we call that offer safety. So let's see. All right, so just to give some context, um, you might be familiar with smart contracts that build on Ethereum in Solidity on top of the EVM, something like that. Um, we are not doing that. We're building on top of the Cosmos network and they use the Tendermint uh, consensus algorithm. So just to provide some context, um, this, is, this is the Agoric stack. So we're not on Ethereum. All right, so today I'll be talking about that top part of the Agoric stack, which is the user defined contracts, Zoe, which I'll explain, and uh, ERTP, which you just heard about. Okay, so what is a smart contract? Um, we kind of have a different perspective than you might have heard. So we define a smart contract as a contract-like arrangement expressed in code where the behavior of the program enforces the terms of the contract. So I think there's, there's two important things here. One is that um, by smart contract, we don't merely mean code that runs on a blockchain. We actually mean something more than that. And then secondly, um, by smart contract, we don't mean a legal contract necessarily. We think that's a, a separate definition. Okay, so, so let's get into it. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, ERC-20 tokens on Ethereum, um, ERC-20 tokens enable one-way payments. So, you know, you just want to pay someone. And the ERC-20 tokens, they have a, um, a ledger or a registry within the code that defines that token. So um, I've kind of tried to replicate that here. It's very simplistic, so, you know, bear with me. But uh, let's say that Alice has a digital asset. Let's call that X. And she wants to transfer it to Bob. So in the, uh, the registry or the ledger here on the right, um, now Bob has X, right? Very simple. All right, so let's say that uh, the payment is actually conditional. Let's say that Alice only wants to give X to Bob if Bob gives Y to Alice, right? So uh, let's say Alice does the exchange first, but then we have a problem, right? So um, at time T1, Bob has X and Y, meaning that he could walk away with both. And I'm sure you're familiar with this, right? It um, goes back to Hobbes, right, 1600, saying that uh, the person who performs first has no assurance that the other will perform after because the bonds of words are too weak. Um, Oliver Williamson built on this point. He called uh, this an example of opportunism um, or self-interest seeking with guile. And then Anthony Cronman, uh, going back to Hobbes, labeled this situation transactional insecurity. So we kind of know that this is a societal problem that we need to solve, and it's traditionally been solved by legal contracts or the legal system. Okay, so smart contracts solve this problem of transactional insecurity, and, and this is really, really cool. So um, if we introduce a smart contract, instead of Alice giving X to Bob, Alice and Bob can both put their assets in the smart contract. So this is going to sound a little strange, but if you look at the, the registry or the ledger to the right, you can see that, at least in code, the smart contract is holding assets in the same way that Alice and Bob are holding assets. So Alice's address has X at time T0, Bob's address has Y at time T0. At time T1, uh, the smart contract address is now the, whatever you want to call it, the holder of the digital assets. And so whether this whether this is actually legal ownership is a question I'll leave for you all. Um, <laughs> I'm not the expert there. Um, but what's really, really cool is that if we give the assets to the smart contract and effectively kind of put it in escrow, Alice and Bob never have access to both X and Y. And so we've solved the problem of transactional insecurity. And so, so we fulfilled the exchange safely. So that's great. The problem is, uh, as you might have noticed, the smart contract is holding all the assets now. So what if that smart contract is buggy or malicious, right? And this is actually a huge problem. So um, there's this great paper called uh, Greedy, Prodigal, and Suicidal Contracts at Scale. And I, I know, great names, right? Yes. Um, so, uh, so they defined these, these three identifiers of contracts that are probably problematic in the Ethereum world. So uh, Greedy, they defined as locked, locks up the digital assets indefinitely. 
Prodigal is uh, sending additional assets to an arbitrary user, one that you haven't seen before probably, and uh, this is most likely an attacker or some kind of mistake. Suicidal, um, this is specific to Ethereum, but this means that the contract invoked the, the quote suicide instruction as part of the EVM, meaning that the contract um, basically deletes itself. So they analyzed nearly a million contracts. They found that uh, quite a few of them were vulnerable to one or more of these issues. And um, what was really cool was that they were using symbolic execution to do this search. They were, you know, they were using machines to do the search and they found um, a parity bug that had already been found, but that, you know, they were able to find it using this method. And that parity bug had uh, locked up a hundred million dollars worth in ether. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars worth of problems here in the smart contract space. Okay, so uh, that was the idea behind Zoe. <laughs> and I think you're actually wearing the same outfit today. <laughs> um, so, I, I did not know this was coming up. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have his collar out. Yeah, there we go, there we go. There you um, go. So, uh, so Mark S. Miller, who's uh, at Agoric uh, with us, um, came up with this idea, and uh, given that if the digital assets are locked up in a smart contract and, you know, that causes all of these problems, well, what if there was a way that the smart contract wasn't actually holding the digital assets? And this is the idea behind what we call Zoe. So what we're doing here is we're trying to partition the risk in smart contracts. So there's really two roles. Uh, the first role is escrowing and redistributing digital assets. And then the second role is deciding how the digital asset should be redistributed. So I'll kind of explain what that means. So, so by escrowing, this means, you know, um, taking all of the digital assets and holding them, right? And so that's what uh, our framework, which we call Zoe does. And then for the second role, this is where your custom behavior or your complex business logic comes in. So this might be, as uh, we saw in the example, just a simple swap. It may be an auction. It may be a digital exchange with the order book. It may be uh, some complex mechanism design. Um, it may be a negotiated uh, contract that actually kind of looks more like a legal contract. Whatever it is that you want that logic to be, uh, that's where the decision of how the digital asset should be redistributed would go. So um, when we go back to conditional payments, um, we call those offers. And an offer is defined as uh, saying what you want and then saying what you are willing to offer in exchange. So going back to our example, uh, Alice was willing to offer X and she wanted Y in return. Bob was willing to offer Y and he wanted X in return. So this, this seems very simple and very obvious, but the really cool thing is that once you have users define things in terms of offers, then we can enforce this new principle, this new safety principle that we call offer safety. And under offer safety, a user is guaranteed to either get what they stated they wanted or get a full refund of what they offered. And connected to offer safety is another kind of um, uh, CS principle that we call uh, payout liveness. And this says that a user is guaranteed to get a payout in a timely manner according to the conditions under which they made their offer. Okay, so um, how does this actually work? So I have kind of a very high level diagram here. Um, so we have the parties to the smart contract on the left here and they exchange digital assets with Zoe. So the escrowing, um, they escrow their digital assets with Zoe. The parties are able to talk to the smart contract. The smart contract is able to talk to Zoe, but importantly, the smart contract never actually gets asset, gets access to the digital assets. So let's, uh, let's walk through this with, um, let's say that we are making a bid on an auction. Um, so, uh, let's first escrow our goods with Zoe. Then we'll tell the smart contract, hey, you know, I, I put these in escrow. I'd like to make a bid on this auction. Um, then the smart contract may send us information back saying like, yes, I've accepted your offer. Whatever it is, this is up to the smart contract. Yeah, just want to make sure. Uh -huh. the, the, um, that is both assets. That, there's an X, there's a red X and a black Y. I'm trying to understand. Oh, Does yeah. that notation mean that, that Zoe has received both assets, one from each party, or that he's received an offer from one party where uh, one of those is what they're saying they want. Uh, I think I'm doing this much more abstractly. So you can think of the X, as y, X and Y as kind of a, the general idea of assets. 
yeah, nothing, nothing as specific as what you were talking about. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so the smart contract can, you know, we'll say, you, you know, we've accepted the offer, whatever it is that that contract wants to say. And then the contract uh, does its own custom behavior. So in the case of an auction, it may hold the bids and, you know, until maybe it gets a certain number of bids, uh, you know, three or something like that, or maybe until a certain deadline has been met. But um, once the smart contract decides to close the auction, then it will try to reallocate the digital assets. Um, so this is the, the very important part where offer safety comes in. So the smart contract uh, calls Zoe and tells it to reallocate with certain information saying, give this to this person, give this to this person. Um, Zoe does a check of offer safety. And if, if offer safety isn't met, if everyone won't, act, won't either get what they said they wanted or get a full refund back, then Zoe rejects this reallocation. So Zoe is actually protecting the parties from malicious behavior by the smart contract in this regard. So if the reallocation passes, offer safety and all of the other invariants, then the smart contract can say complete the offers and this will actually result in a payout to the parties and that's where the transfer of the digital assets occurs. So you can see kind of throughout this whole process, um, the smart contracts never actually had access to any of the digital assets. The users were protected against uh, malicious behavior by the smart contract for that, um, by that. And then also Zoe additionally protected um, the parties by enforcing offer safety. So this may seem very simple, but it's actually, I think it's going to be really amazing because we're gonna be able to enable um, very rapid innovation in smart contracts. You know, we can have people who aren't necessarily expert programmers be building these smart contracts um, and uh, building entirely new things that we haven't seen before, new types of DAOs, what have you. And at the same time, we'll be able to protect the users from malicious or just poorly written code. So, um, so that's kind of the overview of Zoe. And uh, if you're interested in some resources, uh, all of our stuff is written in JavaScript. So this is actually a JavaScript package. If, if you're familiar with that, you can install it right now. Um, this is kind of the pre-alpha version, so we're still working on it. Uh, we have documentation. And if you're interested, you can take a look at the code. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. So thank you so much. Um, happy to take questions if we have some time. Yes, that's great. I'll open up the room for questions. Yeah. Uh, so who is who's um, in control of the logic that goes into the Zoe? So I'm trying to think yeah, about yeah. where the safety comes from, right? So like insofar as the average user probably can't self audit a smart contract, there seems to be that same kind of trust problem with Zoe, unless they can write their own logic. Right, right. Um, so you're right. The, uh, the user is trusting Zoe to a great extent. Uh, we think there's still a significant, um, we still think this is a significant benefit to the user though, because they only have to look at the Zoe code once, because um, it, it can't be easily changed, right? And so, so once they're assured that the Zoe code does the, what they want, then they can interact with these smart contracts that maybe they don't, they haven't looked at as much or they don't trust as much. And the worst that can happen is that they'll get a refund back yeah. if things misbehave. So, so um, that's actually a very good point. So to point out like the, the smart contract can still be malicious in that, let's say it's an auction, it could award the wrong person as you know, the, the item as the winner. It could, um, it could do something really strange and not do an auction thing at all. Um, but what it can't do is steal everyone's funds. So which has been the huge problem, the million dollar problem Got in it. the past. It's like an yeah. abstraction layer where it's, it almost like ports into a bunch of different smart contracts, yeah. not like a one-to-one. -one. Okay, yeah. that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a global, slightly basic question, but by having Zoe in the entire ecosystem, does that also allow you to have a simpler smart contract because you're not trying to program for every single yes. Um, yes. possible scenario? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I've been written, I've been writing, um, I think we have like maybe five or so just example smart contracts, like an auction, a swap, a, a covered call, which would be like a financial option, um, things like that. And uh, I would say it's, it's analogous to having like a, um, a payment service provider in e-commerce. Whereas like, you know, if you just want to have your Etsy site or something, you don't have to deal with handling all of the credit card payments and things like that. So if you're, if you just want to, you have a good idea for a smart contract, you just want to write that, you don't have to deal with all of the messiness of making sure that you're escrowing the payments correctly, 
you know, um, dealing with people's funds, things like that, you can just write the particular business logic for that smart contract and really focus on that. And that's hard enough. You don't need to focus on all of the rest of the escrowing. Nice. Yeah. So you can really think of Zoe as an escrow and an audit tool combined? I think you could say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, so I just want to drill down on that. What do you mean by audit? So thank you. Um, great point. Um, I meant the offer checking. So the offer validation, I consider that sort of an audit of the smart contract. So, I mean, so I'm I, totally non-technical, mm -hmm. so I could be way off base. But. Uh, so I, I'm not, I, um, the reason why I, I perked up my ears at audit is audit is, is, as I understand it, is normally talking about looking into the past and what had happened mm -hmm. as opposed to enforcing uh, uh, constraints on what can happen. I see. Yeah, I, I mean, if you think of audit in the forensic sense of this yeah. kind of past history, yeah, I was thinking like a live quality checking, if you will. Okay, yes. Yeah, yep. yes. yeah exactly. Okay. Uh, looks like we have, um, so um, Yongjing, I may not have pronounced that correctly. Um, the prerequisite for Zoe is ownership must be digitally controllable. Um, Yes, that's that's correct. So, um, so Zoe can only control digital assets. So, um, so right now that's pretty limited, but you know that still covers all of the cryptocurrencies, any kind of uh, you know, financial assets that you can express digitally, things like that. Um, so, anything that is physical that might have a digital representation, there's still the problem of figuring out how to have enforcement on the physical level that matches the enforcement on the digital level. So, so that is uh, definitely a prerequisite. You're right. Yeah, it's a, it's a separate problem. It's a, <laughs> it's a problem with or without Zoe, and Zoe neither contributes nor contributes it to uh, solving the problem, nor does it contribute to making the problem worse. It's just mm -hmm. sort of an orthogonal problem. Mm -hmm. okay. From a user experience standpoint, would there be kind of like a different set of problems for like, let's say, stealing like $50 million rather than like a simple $50 transaction? Like maybe just like, uh, suggesting that the user kind of more carefully reviews Zoe and the actual smart contract itself, or is it kind of like a universal, uniform experience rather? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a very good question. So, so far, everything that I've been mentioning is purely at the code API level, but you can imagine that at the user level, um, your wallet might be um, um, attuned to things like that, saying like, you know, that, hey, you're making a million dollar transaction. Are you sure you don't want to do this, this, and this first to check it? So. Um, so we don't account for that, but that's because this is very low level. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? No, I think that's Roland has said happy holidays, everyone. So maybe that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kate. That was amazing. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, yeah, I was saying also <laughs> verbally too. <Yep. laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. This was our last session this year. So have a great time and see you all uh, in the new year. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. See you all next year. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay.